take a, a quick look at seminar two. Thanks. So our goals for today uh, are to review the course to date, um, take a look at seminar number two, schedule some presentation times, or at least I'll show you how to present, how to schedule some presentation times. We're coming up on the on the presentations the 17th through the 24th, and Lori uh, today is going to talk about. You know, very specifically the kinds of stuff that you're going to be doing in that presentation, she's already done. So here we are, um, uh, right about, well, this got rescheduled. So here we are, um, and this also got rescheduled for the fourth. But here we are in the third, um, in the middle of uh, lecture number five. and. The Delphi teams one and two should have their um, initial surveys up and running by uh, the tenth. No, I'm sorry, not the surveys, but their own work, their own reporting on Delphi. And there was a question whether we were going to continue on with the same set of technologies or whether we wanted to look at a different set of technologies entirely. And my answer to that in the forums was we're now moved off to the two to three year time frame. So previously we were in the, the zero to one year to mainstream uh, um, time frame. And Lori's going to talk a little bit more about the Horizon Report. I, I had a quick glance at her slides. Then uh, team two will be doing the collections. If you guys have not seen the collection done by team one, you have to go take a look at that. Uh, the LibGuide is just stunning. They've done a, they did an amazing uh, uh, degree of work on that. And then the presentation. So let's chat about the presentations. Um, this is a 10 to 15 minute presentation, just like we're doing here at Illuminate. I need you to give me slides, um, uh, and then I'll take those slides and turn them into images. I can't uh, do application sharing or uh, go off to websites or, or do anything fancier than that, uh, just for time's sake. So please give me some slides. You can draw on them if you want to during the presentation, but they really need to be um, you know, just a straight old PowerPoint. There's no transitions or, or any of that stuff. It all goes away. Um, so these are some of the things you can talk about in your uh, advocacy presentation. Um, in the previous class that Lori and I taught, uh, this was the second part of a, of a one piece where you wrote a long paper and then you came and gave the presentation. And for our course, I got rid of the long paper um, so that we could do some of the other things. But so this is the the presentation you would give to advocate for, for a given um, technology or program that you are designing. So I'm going to use a tool called Doodle, and I will send you the link. It's a, it's a long link. Um, these are the times that are available. You don't have to choose them or tell me anything right now, and you know, you'll have this link as soon as we're done with the session. You'll be able to go and, and tell me which of these times do not work for you. And with a group this small, it's going to be really hard for us to get together and have you know a nice nice set of people presenting. So please um, you know be pretty liberal here. If if, if you can move something around, if you can switch something in your schedule, please don't mark that as not available. So this isn't. I've had some people in the past use it as well. I know that I'm going to be presenting at 10 a.m. on Saturday, so I'll mark everything else as unavailable. And that causes a, it causes a little bit of problems. So uh, it's a web-based form. You go in, you um, mark off the the uh, oh, does it say 1 a.m.? Oh, I'll take all those as uh, p.m.s. Sorry, I can change. I'll change those in the uh, so everything uh, time time uh, three. These are all uh, p.m.s. One, two. Uh, well, you'll see them. I'll send you the the link to the form. Do you all understand that? And and this is uh, this is another p.m. as well. <clears throat> okay, so anyway, those, those are the times that I'm looking at, um, 10, 11, 30, 1, and 6 on those dates. So when I send you the doodle form, mark off the ones that you can't do. And please be generous and mark off as many as you, you know, only mark off a few. If they're absolute dire conflict, mark them off. Because I want to I get us in groups so we can see each other presenting. And we can record those, and those are part of your uh, portfolio as well. That uh, counts toward M, the uh, public speaking, as well as um, one of the three technologies. Okay, so with that said, let me 
um, ask uh, uh, any questions. So I'll ask her. Uh, everything is everything is daytime, Sue, so, uh, and then I have the six to to seven or seven thirty times. Well, there are two uh, weekends in that in that set. You can see um, the 19th and the 20th. Lots of times on the weekends. If if that's uh, if that, no other questions on on that uh, quick ramble of mine, um, let's go ahead and get started with Lori. Okay, great. So let me uh, let me give a more formal introduction. Uh, to Lori, I'm I'm a huge fan. I, I I don't think I would have this job if it weren't for her. Um, she as a as a as a director of automation services at Alliance Library System uh, in Peoria, Illinois. She wrote a million dollars worth of successful technology grants and helped 45 rural and small town libraries connect to the internet. She coordinated several collaborative digital pro digi digitization projects, including Illinois Alive and early Illinois women and other unsung heroes. At the same time, she organized and in many cases presented 50 technology programs a year from member libraries. Um, Lori's been collaborating with academic libraries, and she did one of the first 24-7 virtual reference projects. And Lori can tell you uh, probably a little bit more about the amazing conference schedule that she's put together. Um, I, I don't know a person who knows Lori who's not amazed at how, how um, uh, productive she is in, in what she does. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Lori Bell, who's also a, uh, a lecturer like me here at uh, San Jose State. Jeremy, thanks um, for the great introduction. And um, I just have to put in a plug for Jeremy, too. He, um, although he hasn't um, worked in a library, per se, um, through his work at San Jose State. He's done a lot of groundbreaking, innovative work um, and teaching on emerging technologies. Uh, so before we um, get started, I want to give you a, f a fun little quiz. It'll only take, um, it will only take a, few, a few minutes. And what this is is to discover what kind of technology user you are. So if you would just take you know, about five minutes to take that, and then we'll uh, share the results with each other. Um, Don, can you give the description for a roving node? I've never heard, I've never had somebody be that, so I'm not sure what that is. Well, thanks, Jeremy. Um, Anthony, did you take it at all? Yes, Lori. I turned out to be the ambivalent networker. When you read that description, Anthony, does that sound like you or uh, or not? Um, yeah, there's there are parts of it that I agree with. Um, their basic description here is that um, you are a person who has been able to, you know, bring mobile devices um, into your life. Um, through texting and online social networking tools, um, but um, sometimes you might find this all this connectivity to be a bit intrusive, um, and you are confident in your ability to troubleshoot um, devices and services. And um, I'd agree with that to a certain extent. Although actually, I'm I think I'm falling a little bit behind the curve when it comes to mobile devices. I don't. I still have a I have a dumb phone or whatever they're calling them these days. Um, I haven't quite made the leap yet into the smartphone, 
Um, I mean, I definitely see the appeal of having one. I just haven't. Um, it might it might be a little too much, and I'm and I just need to kind of um, come around to that. Okay. Well, great. I know you're not part of the class, but it, it's just interesting with every everybody in the room. Um, Brandy, uh, why do you feel you're more of an ambivalent networker uh, than a digital collaborator? Well, I think really because I do find the fact that I think it's more about other people's expectations, like, oh, you have a phone, or oh, you're online, or oh, you're on Facebook. We can get you anywhere, anytime, all the time. Um, I think it's really other people that push me into the ambivalence. I really enjoy the technology. I like to be kind of ahead of it. I have a smartphone. My husband would tell me, you know, we're watching TV, and when I, I answered the could I get rid of my TV question, and it's like, yes, <laughs> um, because I'll be doing something else. So I love the fact that I now can carry information at my fingertips, or if my husband's on a business trip, I can connect my um, smartphone to my laptop and make it a hotspot, and, and we can, you know, connect and, and video chat, but I think it's that other people have this expectation that now you have to be connected all this time. Okay, Jeremy, well, let's hope that, <laughs> that, that that's a long time coming. Um, what, what I've noticed, I've been in, um, I've been in libraries for over 25 years in a variety of different positions that uh, Jeremy talked about. And I, I love the, the bleeding edge. Uh, the problem is that things are happening so quickly, it's a lot harder to keep up with things than it was even five years ago. So bleeding edge technology is, you know, in libraries, well, anywhere, takes a lot of um, criticism. Uh, bleeding edge technology is so new that you're willing to risk unreliability and greater expense to try it. You don't want to wait for somebody else to try it. You want to be the first one out there um, trying something. Um, also, I feel that bleeding edge is riskier than cutting edge, which I'll talk in a minute. Um, and here, this is from Wikipedia. It says that uh, bleeding edge has been increasingly, increasingly used to be ahead of the cutting edge, um, largely without the negative risk association connotation concurrent with the terms used in more specific fields. Um, I think bleeding edge and cutting edge are, are in um, any field. Do any of you feel that you love working with the bleeding edge in libraries? Anyone on the bleeding edge? OK, anyone on the cutting edge? Which means you may not be the first to do it, but you're right up there ahead of most of the other libraries. OK, and here's another uh, definition of cutting edge, state of the art, highest level of development um, of a device and, or scientific field. OK, so let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, a little more about uh, bleeding edge. Um, a technology is uh, bleeding edge when it contains a degree of risk or possibly a significant downside to early adoption. Uh, lack of consensus, um, other ways of doing new things, and there's no indication which direction the market will go, little un unfamiliarity with the product, uh, lack of knowledge. Um, organizations are trying to implement a new technology or product that the trade journals haven't even started talking about yet, either for or against. And then industry resistance to change. Um, 
trade journals and industry leaders have spoken against a new technology or product, but some organizations are trying to implement it anyway because they are convinced it is technically superior. OK, here's the technology life cycle. Um, the bleeding edge where technology shows high potential but hasn't demonstrated its value. Um, early adopters may win big or they may be stuck with a white elephant. Um, leading edge, a technology that has proven itself in the marketplace but still new enough that it may be difficult to find knowledgeable personnel to implement it. Uh, state of the art when everyone agrees that a particular technology is the right solution. Uh, dated, still useful, still implemented, but a replacement is readily available. And obsolete, it's not maintained or implemented any longer. Um, I know that you guys have been talking about ebooks. Where would you put uh, ebooks in this technology life cycle? Oh, go ahead, Brandy. I guess from the standpoint of the general population, I think that you know they're kind of um, right in between bleeding edge and leading edge. But I think with like um, even the the new you know people are kind of getting them because they're still the digital divide. And I know ebooks aren't always synonymous with e-readers because people can read them on their computers. But so I would still kind of put them between bleeding and leading. But I think from a library standpoint, with like the recent news about Random House and the, the 26 loans, because that's the average loan of a paperback is what they're saying, for libraries, because they don't have a policy or there's not a, um, you know, a real understanding of how it's going to work in a marketplace, it can still be considered bleeding edge for a library. OK. Uh, that was excellent, and I I agree with um, everything you said. Does anybody else um, have any ideas to add to that, where ebooks might be? Well, um, increasingly in the academic library, we're seeing a higher purchase volume of them, um, and that's just you know because of because of budgets and whatnot, I'm sure is what's driving a lot of that. Um, but it's certainly, and it, you know, it's an access issue. Um, so I think maybe it's a little more widely adopted in the academic community over just the general public. Okay, so you're thinking maybe it's maybe state of the art. Everyone agrees that ebooks is the right solution. Uh, they just haven't. We haven't decided on a on a format yet. Jeremy, what does your letter say? No, sorry, I was just finding the uh, um, the source of the controversy that um, I, I forgot which student was was talking about. Um, so this is um, Harper uh, uh, talking about. Um, well, anyway, it's a letter to librarians, sort of uh, trying to mollify the community about these limits. Okay. Um, are there any um, technologies or practices in libraries that you find are um, obsolete? Can you name an obsolete technology? Um, we'll talk more about this in a minute, but there are a lot of uh, ebook readers that are um, no longer implemented. They've been superseded by many versions of um, other ebook readers. Uh, VHS tapes is right, and Microfish too. Both of those. Uh, good job, guys. So the technology acceptance cycle. Here are some of the types of people and how they view technology. Um, innovators, more educated and more risk oriented. Um, early adopters, and these are um, generalizations that, of course, are not always true. Early adopters tend to be younger, more educated community leaders. 
um, early majority, more conservative, but open to new ideas, um, active in the community and influence neighbors, uh, late majority, older, less educated, fairly conservative, and less socially active, and laggards, who are very conservative, um, usually older, and uh, less educated. Um, what kind of technology adopter would you say you are, if you, if you care to share? I would call Jeremy Kemp definitely an innovator, because he's very risk-oriented and very out there trying new and emerging technologies and making them work. Well, thank you, Lori. I, I think that the, the key difference is that um, I, I didn't understand this for a long time. The difference, that, that, as I understand, between early adopters and innovators is that innovators are actually building stuff. They're, they're actually in the process of watching the thing grow and change, and they're involved in it. Early adopters aren't necessarily you know, making it. They're they're purchasing it and they're using it very early, but they're not building it. They're not creating stuff. So that, to me, that, that seemed like the, the biggest difference between those two, which seem, you know, in the vernacular, they're pretty much the same thing. Early adopters, innovators, you know, it's pretty much the same thing. But, but really, it comes down to the act of creation and the act of, of really controlling what's happening. Well, that's another reason why I would call you an innovator, because um, for those of you who don't know, um, I met Jeremy in Second Life in 2007, and he was building, creating the first library school um, within Second Life, and in fact, one of the very first campuses in Second Life. And so he was actually inventing something or creating it. Um, so he was an innovator in that regard. And also, he and a colleague developed an iPad course which is the first that's been available in any library program. So Jeremy, you are an innovator because you're uh, creating new things, new content. So adoption uh, process, um, stage definition knowledge is when you're first um, exposed to an innovation, but you lack information about it. Um, you will be more inspired to find information about it. Persuasion, uh, the in individual, you become very interested in the innovation, and you actively seek information in detail about it. Then the decision process, um, you take the innovation and weigh the advantages and disadvantages of using it. Uh, you research it, and you decide whether to adopt or uh, re reject it. Uh, implementation is when you decide to um, implement, the, implement the innovation, and you determine the usefulness and search for further information. And confirmation is um, the name of this could be misleading, but you have made the decision to continue using it and to use it to its full potential. So I wanted to talk a little bit about technologies in the library field that I've worked with and uh, when they were bleeding edge. Oh, go ahead, Jeremy. Sorry, just real quick, I wanted to point out that your presentations uh, on the 17th are really about getting people moving from um, this stage to this stage. Right, so you're in the persuasive, you're in the advocacy period. So you're taking people that probably have a definite knowledge of what you're talking about and, and the technology and moving them towards a decision uh, for either a, an individual technology or a program. OK. Yeah. So um, and sometimes things may never get back the, the first or the second uh, stage, but this takes you through the the different ways you look at things and uh, make decisions about them. So um, I started as a professional librarian in 1983. 
I'm just going to briefly talk about each of these technologies that you uh, may have heard of and when they were bleeding edge and, and you know, the different things that made them bleeding edge. Um, so in 1983, I was a children's librarian at a public library. And the schools all had Apple IIEs, but there were very few libraries that had Apple IIEs. So I wrote a grant, and we, we got a public access Apple IIE. And so the students came in there, and adults came in who had never used a computer before. Uh, but very quickly, um, other libraries started getting um, Apple IIEs also. And most of the libraries were getting Apple IIEs because the um, IBM compatible, just the price wasn't low enough. Um, there wasn't enough out there uh, for them to buy them. So at this time, when Apple IIEs uh, became popular, the IBMs just really weren't out there yet. All schools were on Apples. and. Then by the 90s, um, most public access computers in libraries uh, were IBM, and the Apples just kind of disappeared. Then in uh, 1989, I worked at a library which had a bookmobile. And I wish I could say I wrote the grant, but I didn't. Uh, the guy before me wrote a grant to automate the bookmobile with cellular phones. If you think about cellular phone, this was um, really early on. Oh, go ahead, Jeremy. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I must have clicked something by accident. Sorry about that. That's OK. So um, we, here we were. We were going to be the first uh, bookmobile in the nation to automate using cellular phone. Well, we found out very quickly that um, the fastest speed was 14.4. A lot of you may not even be able to remember that speed, but it's so slow. And at a lot of the bookmobile uh, spots, we'd have tons of kids, and we'd be waiting. For, you know, it felt like forever for each transaction. So, although this was bloody bleeding edge and exciting. We had to back out of it and just keep track of um, transactions on a floppy disk. It was too soon. It, it really, the service just wasn't ready for cellular phone because the, um, the speed was so slow. And also, the cost was very high. You had to pay by the minute. And so we were paying huge bills um, for slow circulation. So this is an example of something that was really um, bleeding edge um, and just not ready for um, prime time. Um, the next technology I want to talk about is video conferencing. Now we take it for granted, but uh, back in 1996, I was with a, a library system that had um, four different offices across the state. And we wanted a way to offer staff meetings and continuing education through video conferencing. So, and at that time, hardly anyone was offering that. I remember going to a conference, and they were doing video conferencing. And again, the rate was 14.4. Was a little piece of the picture would appear, and then another one very slowly, like a puzzle. And it took three to five minutes to get one image up so that we could see it. So we were able to find a system that worked well over, you know, like a T1 line, a, a fast phone line. But it was very expensive, and the equipment was very expensive, too. So we did get a lot of use out of that, but we kept an eye on things because you know equipment came down, prices came down. Um, we needed that technology, but we had to 
uh, stay on top of it to um, make it work. Any questions so far? Did you try taking Polaroid pictures and faxing them to each other? Now, I think that also the 14.4 modem in the bookmobile, I wonder if it would be useful for someone to be on a terminal uh, in the library and someone in the, in the, in the uh, store, in the, in the, sorry, in the truck to be on the phone. So there's no computer interaction, but you just have a person talking and checking out books that way. I don't know. It might have worked, but it was 22 years ago, and now they've got it down, and it works um, just fine, as you, as you can imagine. Um, digital imaging, you know, more and more libraries are, are putting their historical materials up on the web, and it's amazing how, um, how these Technological advances um, were not that were not that um, long ago. The first uh, grant in Illinois to do di digital imaging was to put up things on Abraham Lincoln, and now um, we're looking at ways to make digital imaging more interactive. Um, just putting flat images on a website is not too um, interactive for people. So now um, libraries are looking at ways to make these interactive and get the, get the community involved. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but ebooks really came out in 1999, uh, 2000. And, um, one was called the uh, Rocket eBook, which was um, a lot like the Kindle Now. It was a little bigger, a little heavier, but it was a dedicated reading device. And um, we did a, a project in a couple colleges using that device and also um, a Franklin eBook Man, which was horrible. But it was the first. Um, e-reader with um, e-reader that uh, had PDA uh, qualities or functions like um, recording and, and things. Um, there were a lot of problems with e-books at that time. And at that time, nobody thought they would last. Um, Tom Peters and I took so much flack were even trying ebooks. Nobody thought they'd ever go anywhere. And look, ten years later, um, Amazon is selling more ebooks than uh, paper books. So that was the bleeding edge. There were a lot of uh, readers that came out that just didn't work well or had a lot of problems. And finally, we have um, choices uh, for some good e readers. Uh, blogs. Uh, people were just starting in 2001, 2002. Uh, they're not that old either. Um, and they started out as diaries or online journals for people, not as uh, professional development tools. And then virtual reference. Um, the first chat reference in libraries started in uh, 1999, 2000. And um, the two people that really started it in the library field, uh, Susan McGlamory and Steve Kaufman, saw that um, stores like Land's Inn on the web would have a box you could click to chat with somebody if you needed help with the website. And they thought, why not do this for libraries? So th that grew very quickly, too. Um, PDAs and medical libraries. Um, just really started in 2001, 2002. And now that's a really, um, I mean, it's, it's just a service that medical libraries offer. Um, digital audio books, it seems they've been around for a very long time. But really, OverDrive and that library and some of the others just got started in 2004. The actual first uh, digital audio book um, 
company, I'm, I can't remember the name of it right now, but was set up for consumers to um, download titles. And they did not want to work with libraries. And then Overdrive, who had been working with um, eBooks, got involved in the digital audiobooks. And look now how many libraries offer these. And web conferencing. Um, in 2004, I worked on some projects to offer book discussions and things using web conferencing. But for libraries, it, it just really wasn't used that much until the early 2000s. Uh, Playaways are digital audiobooks that are on an independent player that you can check out from the library. They just really started in 2005. A virtual Worlds libraries first got involved with um, in 2006. And um, Jeremy, I don't know about you, but I took a lot of uh, criticism for spending time in Second Life. And you'll find when you're on the bleeding edge, um, people, people criticize. Um, they'll make you feel bad, like you're wasting your time. Um, and you just have to go with, with what you think is right. Virtual worlds um, have not to be honest, I thought there would be more libraries and groups involved in virtual worlds right now, and they're not. But libraries still are involved there. And I still think we're going to be moving to a uh, 3D web browser. And then we talked a little bit about interactive uh, digital image multimedia projects. And also, um, handheld mobile library services and SMS reference. Uh, the first library I'm aware of that I did SMS reference was in 2005. But in 2009, it became much more widespread. And libraries became much more aware of um, things they need to um, offer on a mobile platform. So how do you keep up with everything? Um, blogs, uh, there are some really good blogs out there that, like Michael Stevens' Came the Web and um, Meredith Farkas' Information Wants to be Free. There are a lot of really good blogs that will help you keep up. Um, articles. Um, you know, in library magazines and also in uh, trade magazines, technology magazines, uh, books. Um, although the books tend to be a little behind by the time they're published, um, you can get a great overview of a specific topic with a book. Um, websites, when I'm looking to do a new project, I visit a lot of other library websites and see what they're doing and what their results are, and sometimes even email someone if I have questions. Um, electronic lists, there's some really good discussions on some electronic lists, like with the LIDA discussion group and uh, Web for Lib. Um, workshops, I tend to go to online workshops. Uh, and conferences, but you learn as much or more in person. And then contacts that you make through classes and, and through faculty members, these are all good ways um, to keep up. Um, Library Success of Best Practices Wiki is another great resource if you're wondering um, what libraries are doing SMS reference or or what libraries are offering virtual reference, um, you can go here and find a list of libraries that are doing exciting things. Then um, I looked briefly at the uh, Horizon Report. And um, it's saying that the near-term horizon is electronic books and mobiles, augmented reality, and game-based learning. I think that's really exciting. Um, have, have any of you, um, have you, any of you heard about augmented reality?
I'll give you an example. What's interesting about um, augmented reality is that with a lot of technologies, um, libraries aren't so, so place-based. Um, with the libraries collaborating in Second Life, uh, they could be anywhere, and they're collaborating, collaborating to work together and help people with reference requests no matter where they're from. But with augmented reality, it, um, it's, fairly, you know, it's fairly place-based. Um, here's an example. You could be um, in a town, and you're traveling down a street, and on your mobile device, you have a map of where you are, but also uh, pictures might pop up, audio might pop up, a menu of items about like a historical church on the street. Um, so you might look at old images, you might hear an audio audio story, um, and these would pop up everywhere you you go. And um, just a few weeks ago, I was part of a group um, talking to the Lincoln Museum. And they want to use augmented reality to uh, take a map like of a battle. And as, as you look at the map, um, information about different spots will come up and give you more information or stories about that battle. And I know a company that is wanting to work with libraries to take their um, historical pictures and create them into movies, um, create stories about them so that when people are in that geographic area, they can they have access to all that. So there's a lot of different things um, with augmented reality. It's very exciting. And libraries have the materials to uh, make it possible. Another thing that uh, is coming up is game-based learning. And I think that's a really popular trend to um, help um, students look for information and, and making it fun. I know of a company that will create like a scavenger hunt for cell phones in your library. And so um, they have to follow a series of tasks um, that teaches them, and they think it's a game. Um, Sue, go ahead. Oh, no, I mean, I don't know a whole bunch about it, but I think it's the technology that's um, when broadcasters are showing play-by-play, uh, -play, like in replays of, uh, like when they draw stuff onto screens and stuff and they're showing, I think it's the technology that drives like some of those, like I think they've used it in hockey, they probably use it in other sports too, where you're seeing the, the a different rendering of, of what the play was, of something in motion. Is that correct? Um, I really don't know. I, I hadn't read about it being a part of sports, but it very well could be. I think that um, there's a lot of different things that fit into augmented reality, and it's it's kind of a subject that's hard to get your arms around and understand um, all the possibilities. So thanks for sharing that, Sue. Um, four to five years, NMC uh, predicts gesture-based computing and learning-based analytics. One thing I have found is um, NMC, which is a new media consortium, they are on the bleeding edge of everything. They are on top of new technologies. Um, before anyone else knows what they are, they're um, implementing them. And uh, they have a lot of members that are Ivy League colleges and things like that. So. They're really an organization to um, to keep your eye on. So for you guys, what do you think are bleeding edge um, 
ideas for libraries, bleeding edge versus uh, cutting edge. Lori, can you rephrase the question? Sure. Um, of all the technologies out there now, what do you think are uh, bleeding edge ideas? Uh, I think applications that strip away people's privacy, like radically, radically strip away their privacy and do it on purpose. I think that that's it's a pretty interesting field. I think uh, privacy is a very it's a hot button issue for a lot of people, and there's a lot of opportunity for innovation in that space. And I think that's what we're seeing with Facebook. I think they're going to keep pushing that and pushing it and pushing it. Um, you know, when, when you when someone you hear someone get upset because they're going to offer a telephone number on that site. And then you remember 20 years ago, all you had to do to get someone's telephone number was go to the white pages. So people have, um, it's interesting, privacy issues. There's a lot of development opportunities for cutting edge technology around privacy. So for instance, holding up a phone and seeing around you, having the phone recognize everyone's face and tell you what they're doing in, in, on the internet socially. That sort of stuff. Really kind of scary, freaky stuff, but it's cutting edge and it's going to come because uh, the technology and the, and the processing power of these phones and the connectivity of the devices is going to be there. Um, so uh, expect your children and your grandchildren to have completely different visions of privacy. That's a good one. I'm, I'm going to uh, add that to my next presentation. Um, do those of you uh, who are left here, do you think libraries are as on top of these um, leading edge ideas, or do you think that we're falling behind? Go ahead, um, Brandy. I was going to say that I think that they'll hardly ever be bleeding edge um, just because, you know, something I said earlier is that because they're generally, you know, we're talking about public or, you know, academic uh, libraries, not, not special libraries because it's, uh, I think, a different animal, is that they're inherently bureaucratic. Um, they're, you know, funded by the public and they're very driven by the budgets that they have, which, you know, can be easily constrained. and that there's a process and, you know, libraries may have their IT staff, you know, if they're a city, then they may be sponsored by the city's IT staff. So they're going to have, I guess, a hard time being very, very out on the front cusp of anything. Yes, good, good uh, point. Um, for those of you, I all of you will be looking for jobs soon when you graduate. Is working in a in a place that does cutting edge stuff important to you or, or not? Um, when you interview, it's going to be really important for you to um, ask what services they're offering. And if they're not offering uh, some of these, why they're not? Because I think that it will frustrate some of you who want to be offering things and keeping the library out there on the cutting edge um, if, if the library is not doing those things. Another thing to think about, too, is um, it's, it's a quickly changing field. Um, if you have managers or if you have uh, settings that are unwilling to do things that are just even mainstream or even laggard, you really have to wonder that the long-term viability of that institution in, in such a quickly changing field. I mean, you don't have to do, you know, with Second Life and, and augmented reality. I mean, if, if, if the attitude of the organization is anti-change and anti-innovation, it doesn't have a long lifespan. Jeremy, I agree wholeheartedly. And the other point I would make is that um, not every library can decide to do every single thing. Um, you know, uh, but if they're choosing a few things and doing them, 
then that's what's important, you know. Um, nobody can do everything. And uh, so if you're in, a, in an interview situation and you're asking, you know, do you have Facebook, um, if they don't, ask them why. See if they went through a decision-making process um, that it, it just wouldn't work for their community for one reason or another. And not just that they um, ignored it uh, on purpose. I find that a really good point that you made, Lori, because with so many different technologies and information sources and trends on the go uh, and new services, um, I think it's that that really will set some apart is if they can do a few key things really well. So if they have focused on, you know, you know, channeling their energy to doing some services really well, and, and if they have that foundation, then they could look to, you know, growth and 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 moving into other areas. But until I think you see something being done, you know, really, really, um, really sort of uh, with high competency, I think that's what will uh, distinguish, you know, really good good organizations from others, regardless of library type. I agree, Sue. And that's another thing to keep in mind. Technology is changing so fast, and there's just no way um, every library could do everything. So uh, they really have to look at what's out there and make a good decision about what they want to offer, and then also to give it a chance. Um, it may not work out, so they need to set a time frame um, for trying a new technology. Well, Jeremy, thank you for having me. I, I'm hoping that this is what you wanted. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. I, I hope um, this was of interest and that um, you were able to pick up something new. Thank you for coming. OK, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Lori. And, um, I think uh, Jasmine uh, came in in time for Lori's speech, but but um, uh, still has I could still chat a little bit more about uh, what's going on in the course. Um, does anybody have any questions uh, at first? And I'll I'll go back through and and take a look at the um, uh, the beginning of these slides here, so you can see what we did. So we reviewed the course, looked at seminar two. Um, and the schedule of the presentation times is key. If you all see this, um, so I will email the uh, the link to this web survey, and you need to mark off the, the times that you're not available. So just uh, uh, click on the times that you're not available, and try to click as few as possible if you could. And then we'll try and get groups of two or three. Oh, all right. I'm sorry. There's a setting here in. Uh, and illuminate, which lets you uh, roam, and I was roaming. There you go. Um, try to uh, mark as few of these as possible as conflicts, so we can try and get two or three students in a presentation. That'd be that'd be ideal. So um, next up here is your. Um, we should have the mini project is, is done tomorrow, and. Uh, the Delphi project due uh, March 10th. So you'll have your Delphi survey results uh, posted March 10th. And then team two will come in. Is anybody here in team two will come in and do uh, the collection? Oh, OK, great, Sue. Sue, have you had a chance to go over and take a look at the, uh, the LibGuide? Okay, well, be sure to uh, be sure to take a look at that LibGuide. And I, you know, I, I've heard it called LibGuide, and I actually went into the forum of the company uh, that makes the the system, and they um, said it was LibGuide. So, just so you know. So that's all I have for you. If you don't have any questions, uh, let's go ahead and wrap it up.